Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Before we begin, we have a few uh, webinar disclosures we'd like to go over with you. Uh, this webinar is being recorded for archival purposes and has been configured to ensure a safe and positive environment for all participants. Therefore, disruptive, threatening, inappropriate, and all other Zoom bombing behavior will not be tolerated. Closed captioning is available and may be enabled by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. You may type questions for the panelists at any time during this webinar. To start, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Well, thank you for being here. My name is Allison Barton, and I am the health educator here at the Moore Park College Student Health Center. And I am delighted to uh, introduce our speakers for COVID, coping with COVID today. Um, Elmer Guardado is a postdoctoral fellow and uh, works this, this year at the Student Health Center as one of our mental health providers. He received his PsyD in clinical psychology at the University of Laverne. His areas of interest include sports psychology, social justice, equity, and inclusion, and working with first-generation students of color and student athletes. Rochelle Getz is, uh, is, is an associate marriage and family therapist and works also as a mental health uh, provider at the Moore Park College Student Health Center. She has worked at Moore Park College since 2017 and joined the Student Health Center for the 2021 uh, school year, previously working at the University of Miami with student athletes and at the American Film Institute Conservatory. Rochelle has a strong dedication and passion for student success and promotion, as well as a drive to improve mental health functioning. Rochelle is excited about being part of the Student Health Center and looks forward to continuing to provide the best support possible for her students. So without any further ado, coping with COVID-19. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. <clears throat> so welcome everyone to coping with COVID-19. Um, before we get started, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the expectations of this presentation. Um, you know, as many of you have already probably heard, you know, whether it's in classes or on the news, you know, you're constantly being told ways to take care of yourself um, and to keep, you know, take care of your health and your physical health. Um, but I think this presentation um, is, you know, the goal for this presentation is to talk a little bit about how to cope with the mental health aspects, um, the mental health impact of COVID-19. So it's been almost seven, eight months. And, um, you know, before we talk about ways to cope with this pandemic, we need to talk about the ways that um, this pandemic has impacted different areas of our lives and, um, you know, our mental health. So we'll talk a little bit about the, some of the different areas in which COVID-19 has impacted our daily lives and different parts of our mental health, um, you know, parts of our mental health. Um, Rochelle, if you want to add a few other things. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is an unprecedented time that we live in. Um, and hopefully, this is our one and only pandemic in our lifetimes. But we are aware that it is impacting people in many different ways. Um, and sometimes it seems very extreme and sometimes it seems very minor, but we are all being impacted. And so we're excited to share some knowledge with you and give you some coping skills and really you know, help you also understand some of the subjective experience of others, even if it is not necessarily your own. So let's go to the next slide and we can begin. So one of the things that we wanna make sure is that we talk about issues that are relevant to being a student, um, especially a student at Moore Park College. So, um, you know, let's start off with the ways that COVID-19 has impacted students. So as many of you all um, have been experiencing for the last few, um, you know, months, um, the impact, one of the major impacts has been on virtual learning and the impact on learning. So um, all classes have been moved online. Um, which comes with its own obstacles. And for many people who have not taken online classes before, this is something that's new for a lot of people, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that has happened when it comes to virtual learning is something called Zoom fatigue. 
So a lot of students are, um, you know, feeling more tired than usual, are having a difficult time um, staying engaged in lectures, um, especially lectures that are longer than two hours. Um, some students are having difficulties um, learning the material um, or they're feeling frustrated with the way that the material is being presented in, in certain classes. Um, you know, both students and professors are um, having to adjust and um, having to figure out ways to increase, the, you know, increase learning, which can be difficult. And so this is kind of a trial on both sides. So if, you, if you're dealing with Zoom fatigue, if you're dealing with, um, you know, not being able to stay engaged and learn the material, or if you're feeling more stressed than usual with a lot more work than you would have had, um, you know, if you were in person, then that's something that a lot of people, a lot of students are experiencing. Um, other ways that COVID-19 has impacted students, um, it's restricted access to resources, um, you know, being able to access certain resources such as, you know, computer labs, certain facilities, um, you know, even tutoring services which are available virtually, um, it can be difficult to get access to some of these departments which can um, negatively affect learning and can negatively affect your ability, you know, to utilize some of these resources to your advantage. Um, social isolation, you know, for a lot of people, they find themselves feeling more isolated, spending more time in the rooms, you know, or at home, you know, um, being away from classmates, being away from people in general, which can have an, uh, can have an impact. Um, economic impact, um, you know, with the way that, you know, people are losing their jobs, you know, for a lot of more park students who work part-time or even work full-time, you know, that might be impacted if they lose their job and then they're having to, uh, you know, having to, you know, deal with some of the difficulties economic-wise, you know, to afford to pay for classes or afford to buy, you know, pay for different things that they would normally pay if they had a if they had a job. And on the end, on the other side, you know, there are a lot of students who are taking on more jobs. So, um, you know, there are certain people who might take on a second job to be able to help families who have lost their jobs and to, you know, try to make up for the, you know, for the economic impact of a parent not having a job. So I think it's important to understand kind of the both sides of the spectrum when it comes to the economic impact. Um, mental health impact, which is what we're going to talk a lot about, um, you know, today. It can, you know, this 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 pandemic can have a an impact on mental health, well-being, um, you know, depression, anxiety, um, you know, health anxiety, you know, uh, not seeing kind of the light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to this pandemic and not knowing what's going to happen in a few months can create a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. Decreased motivation low energy, a lot of people, again, with Zoom fatigue, you might find yourself feeling um, more tired than usual, even though you might not be as active as you probably would have been um, if, you know, if, if you were doing in-person classes or if everything was, was normal. Difficulty concentrating, like I mentioned, whether it's in classes or just in everyday conversations with people. Impact on class performance. You know, a lot of people are struggling with, you know, being as productive, or being as um, efficient with some classes and might see, um, you know, some, some difficulties in keeping up certain grades, um, which is something that's very common. And the impact on choosing majors and access to require classes for majors, or even the transferring process, you know, this, this pandemic has had a major impact on, you know, accessibility to certain classes, um, you know, or being able to sign up for certain classes, which can be difficult when it comes to transferring or even the transferring process of not knowing um, what's gonna happen in the next few months and having to, you know, apply for, apply to transfer to schools, which can be uh, even more stressful than it already is. So let's go to the next slide. So yes, it is impacting us in so many different ways. And one of those ways is how it's impacting our social relationship. 
How about just the idea of acceptance of COVID-19 as a global pandemic? We have seen people pretend like it is a hoax. We've seen people perish because of it. Um, so it is impacting our social relationships and how we relate to each other, whether or not people even believe it's real. Um, social distancing and wearing masks. You know, you can no longer see people's facial expressions all the time when you're walking down the street. You know, and so in some ways it can be kind of nice that you can stay in your own bubble. And in another way, you no longer get the random hello or you don't get somebody asking if you need help at the grocery store or at your local art store if you're trying to pick out art supplies. People are really maintaining their, dif their distance. Earlier today, we talked about relationships and how we inherently are social beings. And so having these kinds of relationships and having relationships deteriorate to interact with each other the way we normally would is affecting our mental health overall. We're having all of these virtual interactions. Elmer mentioned earlier about um, the Zoom fatigue and being online all the time and how difficult that that can really be. Well, virtual interactions change the way you also interact with people because you're only seeing people from the, the chest up you're only seeing their face. Well, what if they're nervous or uncomfortable and tapping their feet? What if they're fidgeting with their hands? You can't see that, it doesn't translate. So these virtual interactions become sort of a barrier to some of these social relationships that we depend on so much. It's changing our communication patterns. I mentioned earlier about wearing masks in the street and not saying hello to people as they walk by, but it's also changing the way we communicate it's much faster to send a 30 second text than it is to pick up the phone and call. But people are becoming more adept and more likely to send those 30 second texts rather than try to connect via phone call. And connecting via voice is very different than connecting via text as sometimes text messages can be read out of context or with a tone or a voice that you didn't necessarily intend when you sent it. So, it's limiting all of these things. And then it's limiting our exposure to the outside world. It's not just about social distance, it's about sheltering in place. And it's about staying within those walls that you know are safe, that you know aren't necessarily infected by COVID and not exposing other people to COVID-19. So our social relationships are definitely being impacted and changed very much altered based on COVID-19. Next slide, please. So how has COVID-19 impacted family relationships specifically? Well, how about working from home? Everybody is home. You're doing school from home. Your dad is working from home. Your mom is working from home. Or maybe one of your parents has to leave the house for work. Well, every time they're coming back, they're sanitizing, they're washing down, they're making sure they're keeping everyone safe from COVID-19. It's putting everybody in a small space and all on top of each other, which is putting a lot of strain on relationships because there are a lot of competing needs. Who needs the internet at what time for their class or who needs it for the Zoom meeting? Who needs the space that, you know, has the bookshelf behind it or where can you go that's quiet? Um, your housekeeper is coming over and now the vacuum is going and so now you can't have a quiet place to do your presentation. All of this is affecting us. Our time spent together is no longer the quality time for when we come home, but it's the quantity of time. It is all the time. And so sometimes, you know, there's a whole thing called self-care, right? And it's an overused term and everyone talks about it. And what does that mean? Well, it means something different to everyone. But Sometimes we just need time alone to decompress and sort of clear our heads and just be able to sort of be re-centered in the space that we're in. So all of that quantity of time isn't as quality and our interactions, like I mentioned before, are getting much shorter or much more terse because we're under all of this pressure. We have competing needs and limited space. And then sometimes we live with our families and we have higher risk populations. So we have grandma living with us or grandpa living with us, and they may be a higher risk, not only because of their age, but maybe they've previously had pneumonia, or maybe they grew up with 
another kind of disease in their history. And so they may be at a larger risk of catching the disease and we wanna protect them. We wanna protect our families and the people that we care about. These are our social circles. These are our people and they're important to us. So now we're limiting our exposure to people and we're trying to keep our family safe. Well, how about if your family doesn't agree? We talked a little bit earlier about how some people believe that it's a hoax or that it's not real. And then other people are taking the pandemic very seriously and really isolating. People haven't left the house in months because they're ordering groceries delivered from Instacart. So we're limiting our exposure to people. And then with the differing beliefs, it's causing rifts in families because they don't necessarily agree on how it is being handled or how it should be handled. So we're losing those connections. We're losing those connections and the time it's re, you know, related to social distance, but at the same time, there's so much wrapped up in that, you know, and, and what is safety and feeling emotionally safe and feeling physically safe from COVID-19. So it's creating a collective within our entire community, grief and loss over the loss of these social relationships, over the loss of people who have died. And so in addition to that, we also have the collective anxiety because we're worried about what comes next. These unprecedented times don't tell you what's going to come next. So, you know, who knows? We could have a vaccine announced tomorrow. We could not have a vaccine announced for years and only time will tell, but it's creating these collective feelings amongst all of us that's really impacting these family relationships in particular. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 hasn't only affected our families and our social relationships, it's affected our self-esteem. Think about how much has changed in this world. We can't just go to the beach or we can't just go to the gym. So we have much more limited activities. So those of us who, you know, put a lot of effort into our body image and we wanna make sure we're at the gym hours a day because it feels good and we get the rush of endorphins and it boosts our mood our body image is changing because we don't necessarily have access to those facilities anymore. Our self-care is changing. For some people, the gym is self-care. For other people, self-care is sitting on the couch watching Netflix. But there are other people who sitting on the couch watching Netflix isn't self-care anymore because that's all they've been doing for the last few months. And so our ideas of how our society is is beginning to change. And it's changing on a grand scale. You can see it in our social media, but our social media impacts us in the way that we compare ourselves with others. People in California don't have the same activities available to them as the people in Florida. So when you have family or friends that are elsewhere and you're seeing what their lives are like, sometimes we don't feel great about ourselves because we're in that comparison area. Our worldview is changing. We're seeing things on our social media, videos, social justice platforms, athletes standing up for causes that we never got to see before because we were too busy running around, busy with our schedules. We weren't on social media as much. We weren't watching TV as much. We didn't have the access, which is what's creating now this big platform for social injustice and for change in our society. And for people who have been disproportionately impacted, this is a new space to be able to stand up for what they believe in, to stand up for equality, and to stand up for themselves. So we're trying to create these new social support structures via social media that is also in some ways negatively impacting our self-esteem. And we're losing our social support structures because of COVID-19 and differing beliefs and social distance and limited exposure. And so it's really creating a dichotomy of what our competing wants and needs are and where we're at in our society. Next slide, please. So ways that COVID has impacted mental health. We talked a little bit about the collective anxiety. Um, there are both physical and mental health related anxieties. You know, people who are sick, who have limited access to health resources, they don't necessarily wanna go to the hospital because what if there's a COVID patient there? It's leading to depression. People are isolated. People don't have the outlets they used to have to be able to talk about it or to be, to be able to connect with people. Post-traumatic stress. COVID-19 as a pandemic is a trauma. We are all experiencing it. 
And so as a result, we are under a lot of stress and we likely will have symptoms of PTSD, including hypervigilance about cleaning ourselves and making sure we wash our hands for 20 seconds and enough time that will be evident as, as time will tell. There are relational concerns. There are sleep disturbances. How do you get to sleep? You know, it's we're in our bed all the time studying and reading and doing what we need to for school. And, and now our bed is a place where we're awake all the time. Stress, general stress, work stress, life stress. We've talked about some of these stresses. They're real and they're still happening during this pandemic. Life has not stopped. We're removing ourselves from people. We are starting to isolate. We are beginning to shut down. Substance use. Substance use has been on the rise, as has violence, domestic violence within the home, because people don't have those outlets. People aren't able to get out and get the help that they need. Isolation, phobias, it's creating some compulsions, and coping strategies. Our coping strategies are changing emotionally, socially, and instrumentally. All of these are adjusting. And we're developing new coping strategies. We're losing some of the ones that we held on so tightly to. And so COVID-19 is really shaping a new society for us on many different levels. Next slide, please. So before we could talk a little bit about what are some ways to cope with everything that's going on, I think it's important to understand how COVID-19 has had different impacts depending on different communities. So contrary to what you might see on the news, you know, you might see general statistics, you might see certain groups, but you don't, you don't really see the actual communities that are being impacted or the actual demographic differences. So I think one of the things that's, um, you know, that's now starting to be shown in the media is how COVID-19 has impacted marginalized communities, right? So there is, you know, increasing evidence. And again, this pandemic is, is relatively new, you know, seven, eight months. So a lot of researchers are scrambling to, to um, you know, figure out what communities are being impacted more. But it's been found that racial and ethnic minority groups are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So the majority of um, you know, victims of COVID-19 or people contr you know, contracting COVID-19 seems to be people of color and people from low income neighborhoods. So why is that the case? Um, you know, there are many different cases and I'll just touch upon some of the main ones. So first one is discrimination. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, individuals of color have a hard time getting, uh, you know, um, higher quality, you know, health care or access to higher quality health care. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of individuals might have something like Medi-Cal, where, you know, a lot of the hospitals that take Medi-Cal might be inundated with so many, with so many um, patients that they can't you know, they can't really offer quality service to everybody. And, you know, discrimination also happens in the workplace. Right? A lot of, you know, communities of color, you know, a lot of people that come from communities of color, um, you know, might have certain jobs that exposes them more to COVID-19 or might have difficulty getting higher paying jobs or might be the first ones to be let go. Um, from a job because, you know, because of some like discrimination that, you know, in, has historically been a part of, of our society. Um, healthcare access and utilization, that's something I briefly touched upon. You know, um, communities of color, you know, people from low income neighborhoods, they tend to have um, lower quality health insurance, you know, Medi-Cal that's, you know, that's burdened by, you know, low resources. So a lot of people who have something like Medi-Cal are dying in vast, you know, higher numbers um, because they're not getting the quality that they need or because they're not being seen because, um, you know, COVID-19 is the priority. So 
When I say that COVID-19 has impacted marginalized communities, I just don't mean COVID-19. What's happening is a lot of people um, are losing their lives because they're not able to have routine non-COVID surgeries because there's not enough resources um, to, to cover that. So a lot of people are avoiding going to the hospital and dying uh, you know, of other um, you know, medical illnesses. So that's a big part of you know, the inequities of healthcare when it comes to communities of color. You know, occupation, you see that a lot of the jobs that, are, um, that people are losing are oftentimes you know, um, jobs that are dispensable. But on the other hand, a lot of the frontline essential workers, you know, tend to be people of color. So people of color tend to have jobs such as maintenance or, you know, the working hotels or service industry, which can increase the amount of exposure that a lot of these communities are, um, a lot of these individuals are being exposed to, which increases their likelihood of, um, of getting COVID. And I think the other thing that's important to understand is, you know, in a lot of communities of color, there are multiple family members living in the same house. So that increases the likelihood of transmission if you have multiple families living in a house or if you, you know, or if you have um, at risk, you know, at risk individuals like your grandmother or your grandfather who you can't afford to, um, you know, to live by themselves, right? So they have to live with you, which increases the likelihood of transmission. And I think the other part that's also important to understand is um, the idea that isolation is not the same for different communities. You know, there are certain people who can't isolate um, if they, if, they, if they are infected with COVID because they don't have their own room or there isn't a spare room in their house who live in small apartments. So you see all these things are starting to happen that increases the numbers, you know, that's driving the numbers up of, you know, uh, people who come from marginalized communities contract, you know, getting this virus and ultimately dying because they don't receive the care, you know, that they should be receiving. So. Other aspects that I have touched upon, educational, um, you know, again, you know, when it comes to a lot of communities of color, they tend to have jobs, you know, like I mentioned, so, you know, um, service jobs, maintenance jobs, or just all kinds of jobs that, you know, increases their likelihood of being exposed. Income-wise, you know, um, like I mentioned, that has an impact on, you know, how many people live in your house, your ability to afford food, your ability to, you know, um, you know, be okay with unemployment and not have to worry about, you know, taking care of your family, which is not the case for a lot of families in these communities who need a job to take care of their, you know, to take care of the bills or who are even losing their houses or losing, you know, um, you know, are not able to live in apartments. So you see a lot of rise of um, homelessness when, it, you know, during these times more than ever and again, the wealth gaps, you know, communities of higher income, you know, tend to have an easier time, ability to isolate, you know, to have higher health care, whereas communities of color um, have a much harder time, which then is starting to reflect in the number of deaths and the number of people who are um, contracting this, you know, um, getting this virus. And again, housing, you know, with, with people losing their jobs, you know, even though, you know, um, there's rent freezes, that's starting to go away. So families that live in these communities are not able to afford the rent or their mortgage because they've lost their jobs or because their hours have been cut, right? And, you know, for a lot of students at Moore Park who come from these communities might, you know, have, been, you know, might be experiencing this where they might have to take on extra jobs to make up for their, for their um, dads, you know, um, their dad's job that they lost. So you see, you know, so this is where COVID-19 has had a disproportional impact um, depending on some of these marginalized communities. So let's um, go to the next slide and talk a little bit about, you know, have some numbers um, that we can compare. So this, these ratios are compared to, um, to white individuals. So when it comes to cases, you know, there's 2.8 higher 
you know, cases in, you know, American Indian or Alaska Native, you know, um, you know, Native American populations have been have been impacted really um, roughly in a lot of reservations. Um, and again, the healthcare is not as, you know, it's, it's not high quality. So there's a dispor disproportionate amount of deaths. Um, when it comes to cases, you know, um, those who identify as Asian um, are 1.1 higher than white individuals. So you, you really start to see the disproportion um, when it comes to getting this virus with, you know, African-American and you know, Latinx um, communities, as well as Native American communities. So you see 2.8, 2.6, and then 2.8 higher than white individuals. And, you know, that's not surprising given that these marginalized communities are, you know, tend to have a lot of African-American and Latinx, um, you know, individuals. But if you start to see the hospitalization, you know, it's the same trend, you know, there's higher hospitalization in these groups, 5.3 times higher, 4.7 times higher, 4.6 times higher. And in the deaths, you know, you really see an increase as well, right, in these communities. So a large amount of deaths that are occurring because of this virus are majority, um, you know, individuals of color. So this are, these are some of the trends that you can see that this, 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 uh, this virus has, you know, has impacted some of these communities disproportionately. So let's go to the next slide. So you know, now that we know that there are certain communities that are, are higher at risk um, for contracting this virus, you know, what can you do to sort of cope with this, with this pandemic? Now, before we start talking a bit about ways that you can cope, I think it's important to understand that we cannot control some things, right? We cannot control this pandemic from ending. Like Rochelle said, you know, we don't know when there will be a vaccine. You know, a lot of people don't know when we will, you know, we will get back to normal. There is kind of a prediction, you know, but it seems like, you know, that this is something that's going to stick around for a while. So. Instead of, you know, a lot of times you might have heard, you know, take care of yourself, engage in self-care. Um, like Rochelle said, some of these things that maybe you used to self-care don't no, no longer work because, you know, you've been doing it constantly and, you know, it's not making you feel better. So when it comes to some of these things that we're going to talk about, you know, you want to create a toolbox with ways that you can cope with this. And, you know, and you constantly want to be, able, you know, redefine and adjust, you know, some of these, some of these ways to cope, you know, if something doesn't stops working, then trying something different. So let's talk about some of the ways that as students, or just in general, you can cope during this, you know, during this pandemic. So I think the most important um, ways to cope is being able to take some time to feel what you're feeling. You know, it's okay to not be okay during these times. And it's also okay to prioritize yourself. So, you know, for a lot of people who are usually, you know, who are usually on the go and who are really busy, this pandemic has forced them to, you know, to stop. And when you stop and you have, you don't have a lot of things to do, you might find yourself thinking of, you know, thinking a lot and having a lot of thoughts and, you know, and thinking about some of these things that maybe you wouldn't have thought before. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to take, you know, take the time every day to ask yourself how you're feeling, um, you know, whether it's some of the things that Rochelle talked about, whether, you know, it's about your self-esteem, whether it's about family, whether it's about um, friendships, whether it's about your situation in school. It's important to understand how you're feeling so that you're able to know when you might be feeling anxious or when you might be feeling depressed or, you know, when you might be feeling other um, difficult emotions. So how do you do that? So, you know, there's different ways that you can self-reflect. So journaling is one of the most more popular ways to self-reflect for a lot of people who have uh, trouble expressing um, or identifying how they feel sometimes putting it into words can also have a powerful effect. So, 
there's different types of journaling styles. You can, some people like to just write how they feel, um, you know, without any structure, without any, um, you know, framework. Other people like to answer questions, um, you know, when they journal. So it really is depending on what works for you. And I think the most important part of journaling is being able to go back and reading what you wrote so that you're able to, you know, not only express how you feel, but also process your thoughts and process your feelings at the same time. Uh, meditation is something that's thrown, you know, that's thrown around a lot, but meditation can mean many different things. So mindfulness can mean practicing, you know, five to 10 minute uh, mindfulness exercises every day, which can increase your ability to be in the present moment and to pay attention to, you know, how you're feeling, you know, physically to be able to, you know, increase your acceptance of your thoughts and awareness of, you know, of what's going on internally. But, uh, you know, a more general way of, you know, mindfulness and meditation is, you know, taking a mindful approach to everyday life. So we oftentimes think about the past or we think, we think about the future, you know, and that's usually what happens when you start to feel anxious or depressed. So learning how to take a mindful approach to daily life and remembering what day it is, remembering the date, what is, you know, what is your daily, um, you know, schedule, being able to stay in the moment, you know, whether it's when you're eating, whether it's when you're talking to people, you might find yourself feeling distracted, but learning how to reorient your attention to the present moment is a big part of um, mindfulness meditation. And Allison just posted something on the chat, um, you know, that, you know, the Student Health Center website, we do have a curriculum or a program to, you know, to, to practice mindfulness and to get a better understanding of what mindfulness meditation um, is. So I definitely encourage you, um, encourage you all to visit um, the webpage. So other types of ways to take care of yourself, being able to schedule breaks, whether it's between classes, whether it's between, you know, even during class, being able to stand up and stretch every, you know, every hour for like five to 10 minutes, being able to take a walk to go outside and you know, get some sun. Even as we head into the winter, being able to go outside for a little bit, you know, it can be very powerful and can be very helpful. Um, you know, exercising, we, you know, like Rochelle said, gyms might be closed, but that doesn't mean that you can't go for a jog or you can't just go walk around your neighborhood. Because we are, we are spending more time at home, we're more sedentary, we're not as active as we would be if we were, um, going to classes or, you know, going to different places. So being able to include exercising to your weekly schedule, it doesn't have to be every day, but being able to, um, to, to be a little bit more active or stay a little bit more active is very important. Um, taking breaks from the news, you know, social media, oftentimes we get really sucked into what the news is saying, um, to what social media is saying, which is something that's, you know, that's been coined the term doom scrolling. So doom scrolling is, you know, having your mood be impacted by the negative, you know, messaging or just the negative news that you might be exposed to. So there's been um, research has been done where people who spend a lot more time with social media, especially right now, have had their, you know, their, their mood negatively impacted. So taking a break from, from the news, taking a break from social media, you know, scheduling times during your day where, you, you know, an hour of your day where you can go on social media, where you can watch or read the news so that it doesn't blend throughout the whole day, right? So you want to be able to take breaks, but also schedule times where you can do some of these things. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm just going to go over these a little bit more general. So, you know, affirmations, gratitude, I think, you know, with everything going on right now it's really it's really easy to feel pessimistic it's very easy to feel hopeless and I think being able to you know um, reframe that thinking in the situation and being able to focus on the positive things that are going on or you know the positive things that you did or the positive things that happen and just positive things about yourself you know Rochelle talked a little bit about self-esteem so you know for a lot of people who might not have the same level of you know 
social interaction, might feel more negative about themselves, might feel more lonely, and then you might start going down this sort of rabbit hole. So learning how to, you know, learning how to be self-sufficient in the way that you feel about yourself. So whether it's writing things down on a piece of paper and putting it on your wall so that you can look at every day, or, you know, or putting on your phone, things that you like about yourself, things, you know, good things that happen during the day, what are you grateful for? It's always about the way that you frame your situation and seeing the other side of the coin, not just seeing the negative, you know, um, pessimist, you know, the pessimistic um, view of it. So, you know, affirmation is gratitude. That's something that a lot of people do in order to keep themselves grounded and keep themselves feeling positive. Um, again, using this time to develop your self-care routine. So like I mentioned, being able to constantly change what works, what doesn't work, you know, and being able to constantly uh, find new things that you can do to um, take care of yourself and to, you know, be able to avoid Zoom fatigue or burnout. So creating SMART goals, you know, um, being able to have short-term goals versus long-term goals. SMART goals stand for specific, uh, a goal that's specific, a goal that's measurable, a goal that's attainable and relevant and also time-bound. And the reason why the SMART goals are important is because, you know, because there's so much uncertainty with, with the future, sometimes it's important to stay in the moment or at least not too far ahead. You know, what are some goals that you can create for the day versus the week versus the month, right? So that you have a different range of goals that you can sort of look forward to and work on. And, you know, goofing around for a bit, you know, scheduling times of, you know, play or just mindless, you know, mindless thinking, you know, whether it's laying on your bed, whether it's, you know, jogging with family members, whether it's watching funny, funny videos, funny YouTube clips, you know, humor is something that um, has been found to help, you know, when people are feeling overwhelmed or feeling very intense emotions. So, you know, watching things that make you laugh or watching things that are humorous. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, some of the things that some people have found um, helpful is being able to clean your space and get organized. So being able to set boundaries in your room, right? If, you know, so that you don't find yourself on your bed the whole day, right? So you, you might want to reserve a space in your room or a space in the house where all you do is work, right? Or all you do is listen to lectures or do homework. So you wanna be able to separate these spaces so that you learn that your bed is for relaxing or a certain part of your room is for relaxing and then another part of your room or your house is for work because what's happening right now is that you know you find yourself in your pajamas the whole day and laying in bed watching lectures and then like Rochelle said when it comes time to go and sleep your your mind and your body has associated the bed to being awake or to be active, which is causing a lot of people to have difficulty falling asleep. Um, you know, being able to unplug for an hour and free yourself from social media, I mentioned that already. Um, some of these things I already mentioned, you know, indulging in your hobbies, watching Netflix. Now that's something that, you know, it may be that a lot of people are kind of tired of doing that. Um, but I think, you know, figuring out other ways to stay um, engaged, whether it's, you know, watching documentaries versus watching, you know, short YouTube videos, you know, but also being able to draw or read or at least, you know, listening to upbeat, upbeat music, right? I think, you know, just like with humor, listening to upbeat, happy music can really have a positive impact on your mood. So maybe taking five to 10 minutes to listening to, you know, certain upbeat music can help a lot of people. So again, checking in with your emotions, you know, sitting quietly and just naming what you're feeling without any judgment um, for what you're feeling, right? Taking a long bath or shower, sitting around, developing, this is what I mean about developing your self-care routine and spending time with your pets. You know, for a lot of people, having a cat or having a dog or just having other pets can be such a powerful, um, you know, way of, of coping, you know, a lot of studies have shown that pets do have a positive impact on, on, on mental health. So, 
you know, if you have a pet, you know, maybe just spending some time to play with them. If you don't have a pet, maybe considering adopting, um, you know, a, a, an animal. You know, I know I have, I recently adopted two kittens, so I've had a very positive impact on, on my mood. Um, so those are, you know, some things that you can do. Um, next slide, please. Asking for help. So this is something that's very important, you know, whether it's big or it's small, but being able to reach out and, you know, being able to reach out to professors if you're struggling um, with classes or you're struggling with grades. You know, a lot of professors are wanting students to reach out but are having trouble having students, you know, come to office hours or even reach out on how they're, how they're in the class. So a lot of professors are having trouble understanding, are they actually getting the material or are they just so zoomed out, you know, so zoom tired that they don't even want to like say how it's going, right? So being able to advocate for yourself, um, you know, and again, if you feel like you're struggling with anything more significant, whether it's depression, anxiety, or just need someone to talk to, um, being able to reach out to the Student Health Center, um, you know, which can be very helpful. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the services that we offer or reaching out to a friend. Um, you know, again, social distancing does not mean social isolation. Right? I think that term has been coined. Um, you know, it's very misleading. So just because you're physically distancing yourself from friends and family doesn't mean that you have to isolate yourself. So it's actually not social distancing, it's actually just physical distancing. So you know, being able to connect with friends, whether it's through Zoom, whether it's through FaceTime, whether it's to, you know, through safe ways of like interacting outside of a park or, you know, being able to be mindful and, uh, and safe. But, you know, just because we're all social distancing doesn't mean that we need to stop talking to our friends or we need to stop, you know, seeing some of our friends, right? It just has to be in a very responsible manner. So again, making yourself a priority Taking control of your life is something that's very important because there are a lot of things that are going on in our lives right now that we can't control. What are some things that we can control? So, you know, focusing on that, you can control what you do on a daily you know, basis. You can control your schedule. You know, you can control going on walks. You can control cleaning your room, right? You can control, you have control of your space, you know, for a lot of people. You have control. So these are some of the things that you do have control. So a lot of things that, you know, some of the things that you can do is create a list, right? Create a list of the things that you can control versus the things that you can't control. And then so that you start to realize, oh, I'm worrying more about things that I can't control. How about I change my focus on things that I can't control? So that really does help people, um, you know, um, you know, it helps people from being very overwhelmed with things that they can control, which is very common in a lot of people who are dealing with anxiety right now. So, you know, again, looking for social support is another big thing. For a lot of students at Moore Park who this is your first semester and you didn't get a chance to create any friends or if you're meeting classmates for the first time through Zoom, which is very impersonal and you don't get a chance to even make any connections, you know, being able to find ways um, to create new social networks just because we're all, you know, social distancing but physically distancing doesn't mean that we can't make new friends. So we can make new social groups. So whether it's inviting classmates to, um, you know, to certain, you know, um, study meetings or, you know, to reaching out to, on the chat or just reaching out to different people and creating times to meet or to, you know, have times to actually introduce yourself outside of the classroom. Um, you know, those are some ways in which you can increase your social support network. And again, continue to do activities um, and, you know, and, and, and maintaining a healthy sleep schedule. So a lot of people are going to sleep later. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in our sleep presentation later on today. Um, you know, a lot of people's sleep schedule is being negatively impacted with everything that's going on because we are spending times um, at home, more time at home, or we're not as active. Um, you know, it's something that we can definitely talk about in, um, you know, later on. Next slide, please. 
So again, these are some other ways that you can take a look for yourself. Deep breathing, imagery, eating balanced meals, making sure you're taking care of your basic needs. And basic needs are eating, sleeping, right? Making sure that you're, um, you know, getting restful sleep, making sure that you're eating consistent throughout the day, um, you know, eating balanced meals. Um, so those are some of the ways that can help you and protect you from having any sleep difficulties or anxiety or depression. So let's go on to the next, um, next slide. So these are some resources that you can definitely access. Um, and I think we'll find a way to share some of these resources um, so that people can you know, know about it. So, you know, you have meditation, mindfulness um, resources uh, where they have free mindfulness exercises. So these can be very helpful. Um, and I'm sure that's being shared in the chat. So for the sake of time, um, let's move on to the next slide. And so you also have apps, different apps. And then, you know, hopefully we can also share this. So, you know, you have mindfulness apps, you have therapy for black men, therapy for black girls, and, you know, you have liber liberate meditation exercises, which are mindfulness exercises um, created for people of color. So Instagram has therapy for Latin X, which is uh, an account that has a lot of, um, you know, recommendations and a lot of uh, information on, on mental health. So let's go on to the next slide. And as you all know, uh, the Student Health Center is here. We have many different services available. Um, we're confidential. It is not part of your academic records. We also have medical care in addition to our mental health counseling. So for our medical care, we deal with acute illnesses as well as some chronic illnesses. Um, we do do medical treatment for depression and anxiety, as well as STI and STD testing. We also do some basic vaccines, lab work, and medication for a very nominal fee. Under the mental health side, we do allow up to six sessions per semester. Um, and a lot of the topics we discuss are abuse, anxiety, stress, and panic attacks, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, eating disorders, low self-esteem, intimate partner violence, relationship, part, relationship problems, relaxation training, sexuality, and social injustice. This is not limiting. These are just some of the topics that we cover. Next slide. So for student health services, these are our hours and appointments. We are open Mondays and Thursdays, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Friday from 8 a.m. till noon. Please note that mental health counseling does now have some extended hours between Tuesday and Thursday up until 8 p.m. So please feel free to call the Student Health Center at 805-378-1413 to schedule your appointment. Um, we are using HIPAA compliant Zoom in order to perform telehealth and we are happy to be of service to you and help you through this time that is unprecedented and a little bit bonkers for all of us. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we really look forward to helping you as you continue on in your journey at Moore Park, and we hope to see you soon. Well, thank you so much, Elmer and Rochelle, for sharing this such an important topic uh, at this time, of course, and, um, and for all the good work that you do for our students here in the Student Health Center. Um, again, make an appointment. We are there for you, uh, for your students, for those of you who are professors listening in uh, right now. And um, I hope you join us for the rest of our schedule today. We have, um, we have a presentation on um, suicide coming up and then after that sleep. So lots of, lots of really good information coming your way. So thank you again so much. Oh, Elmer and Rochelle, you did a remarkable job. I'm so impressed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to Allison for making all of this happen. I don't think she heard me.